Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about facing doubt with our faith. That's right. In reality, all Christians face doubts sometimes in their faith life. And we're going to talk about how to address those doubts, overcome them, and understand them. Look, if one of the apostles is known as the doubter, it affects so many of the body of Christ. So let's look more deeply into what can come through doubt into the conviction of faith. All right. Great topic. Uh, so eloquently put, you know, the Thank apostles you. experienced that. Thank you. Uh, one of the apostles. And well, we've all experienced it. No, too. and it's true. And, yeah. I, and this is why I love St. Thomas, because doubt is not a sin. It, it, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, a moral issue. Mm. Doubt is something that we experience through life. And many saints have had to battle incredible fights with doubt. But doubt can be the passageway into a greater, stronger faith that would lead St. Thomas to India and some legends say even further, but ultimately to give of his life in India and establish one of the apostolic traditions of one of the strongest groups of people in India living out their faith. You know, looking at doubts, any Christian who tells you they don't have doubts is either incredibly blessed with a very specific and very rare charism or lying. Everyone has doubts. Mm -hmm. I've doubted. The popes have doubted. Saints have doubted. Apostles have doubted. Because the reality is, is that we, I mean, we worship a hidden God. Yeah. We worship a Savior who has been off of this earth for 2,000 years. We worship and have faith in things that we do not see and cannot touch. Mm. That is hard for people who, number one, rely on the physical senses for proof. And then number two, are faced with all kinds of challenges and struggles. Now we're going to get into the sacraments of the church oh, sure, sure. without a doubt in this and, and why the Catholic church um, is, has been established and instituted by Jesus Christ in the sacramental life and how it does produce strong faith in the followers of Christ through these sacramental signs. But, you know, before we get into that, I think it's important to realize that in the apostolic college of the, of, of all of the apostles, you have somebody like Nathaniel, you know, Bartholomew, and it, it, that in, in his heart, he had no guile. He quite quickly came to realize who the person of Jesus was, and that was it for him. So that's, that's all he needed. And there are people in our community that have the same type of conviction of faith, but a greater majority of us, you look at through the rest of the apostles, I mean, hey, there were many moments of, of doubt. Even in the uh, Old Testament, you know, I, I think of Gideon, you know, he's like, I don't really, I don't want to go down there and battle these dudes. Yeah. So he flipped his fleece over. He's like, do it again. <laughs> like, give me another sign. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily doubt, but it, it is a, a, a lack of, of faith in a sense that God is very merciful with us therein. Dude, I'm, I'm like, I'm going through it all the time as well in my own personal journey yeah. where it's like, okay, this is a gift, God. But like, do you really want me to have, you know, like, yeah. It's like I, I constantly I'm, I'm receiving all this consolation in this moment. Like, are you, are you sure this is where I'm supposed to be? Like, aren't I, am I not supposed yeah. to be? You know, so it's like it is doubt. Doubt is a, a regular thing. And we've got to work through it through prayer. Yeah. It, it makes life an adventure. Yeah, it does. Honestly. That's the adventure. Well, it's an adventure that I don't really ask for. <laughs> you know? Look, I don't want that. I don't, I, you know, there's been times in my life where I seriously questioned the existence of God. And I think there's a lot of people who have. And like you said, it's not a sin, but it's a, it's a reality of the Christian faith life. It's a reality of the, just the mechanics of how the universe is created by God. It's pretty hard to believe sometimes, especially when you're either struggling with challenges or, or trauma or overcoming you know, real grief and sorrow, or even in times where you just don't see the need for God. I mean, there's so many reasons that people doubt the existence of God, the need for God, or the reality of Jesus Christ in the church. And I think that's shameful for a lot of people to admit. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Christians <clears throat> will never admit that they have doubts. But yeah, I mean, the world's brutal. It's really It's rough. really brutal. And like, 
to lose your faith is, you know, it's a, it's a rational, almost a, a rational thing. It's not super rational, but it's like a rational thing to, to enter into despair and doubt. <clears throat> but the, the beauty of, of God is that he meets us there. Mm. He shows us things in that valley and then he builds us back up and uh, it's, and it strengthens your faith. Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict the 16th in his book, Introduction to Christianity, he talked about exactly what you're talking about. He said, first of all, the believer is always threatened with the uncertainty, which in moments of temptation can suddenly and unexpectedly cast a piercing light on the fragility of the whole that usually seems so self-evident to him. Just immediately out of nowhere, the whole thing seems like it can come down on top of you like, wait a second, this uh. doesn't make any sense. How could God be real if this happened? How could God be real if this kid's, mm. you know, if kids got bone cancer or mm. there's war or, I don't know, it's been 2,000 years and Jesus had come back or the people in church are all mean? Like, like that happens to people, you know, yeah. saints, sinners, and everyone. Even most <clears throat> most re recently, you know, the fires in Lahaina and in, in Maui. Yeah. You know, like, and and all of the the pain, all the suffering. It's like, where is God in the, in the disasters of life? Where 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 is God in the wake of the storm, in the hurricane, the the earthquake, and and all of that? And you know, God leaves you know marks of His presence in the chaos of this terrible world that you guys are describing, like the, the sin, the, the natural disasters, all these different types of things. And, and what I loved in, in one of the aspects of, of uh, seeing God present is the church in Lahaina was left untouched. And for a number of people, that was, that was like, God is with us in this terrible pain in this terrible loss. And, and these become occasions where, yeah, there is a lot of bad things that happen in the world, but God will never leave us because he loves us as a father. And he's going to be right there in the middle of, of the recovery efforts. Mm -hmm. um, Pope Benedict went on in, in that quote. He, and here's something I think is important. He says, um, in a situation like this, what is in question is not the sort of thing that one perhaps call, quarrels about otherwise. The dogma, the assumption, the proper use of confession, all this suddenly becomes absolutely secondary. Mm -hmm. What is at stake is the whole structure. It is a question of all or nothing. That is the only remaining alternative. Nowhere does there seem to be anything to cling to in this sudden fall. Um, we get comments like this all the time from people, you know, in our comments, like, hey, I used to believe in this and then something happened and yeah. then I don't believe in the faith anymore. I got I got hurt. I started questioning it and it, boom, it, it, it happens real quick to people, right? Yeah. They don't wait for the miracle to happen. Right. You know, it's like there's something there inside of all of it and they back out before God comes and meets them. Yeah. There. And and that could be fear. Mm -hmm. No, know, that could be self-destruction. Um, mm -hmm. But it also, to your point too, it could be an injury that's mm -hmm. been experienced in the church where, you know, a teacher of the faith wounded somebody by not teaching properly what is truly upheld by the church. It could be someone... Uh, you know, in, a, in a, a case of mispractice. I just had this, somebody's been away from the church since they were in their teenage years and it was based on um, end of life care and this priest coming in and saying that he wasn't going to give the sacrament of the anointing and viaticum to this person unless they tithed and 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 committed something financially Ooh. to the church. That is, and and the wow. privilege for me is to sit in front of this man who's dying, and bring him home after being away from the church after such an injury. Whoa. And I said, I am so sorry wow. that you have suffered this in the name of the church, mm. but it's my privilege to express to you that that is a gross and horrible case of mispractice. And it, sa it states very clearly in canon law that you are to not charge for the sacraments. This is a free gratuitous outpouring of God's canonic love mm. in salvation of your soul. And he literally asked me like, when I, when I receive this, do I have to give 
give anything oh, to you. I'm like, oh, absolutely what not. Yeah. What a wound. And the beauty of it was in the sensitivity and the tenderness <clears throat> of it. And as I sat with him in his last hours of life, I was able to receive him in the name of Jesus. And I saw Jesus heal that deep wound and receive him in the church and his soul was saved. Glory to God. And he literally, and this poor man couldn't even like walk, right? It, it was, he was very close to the end. At the end of confession, and he, he was able to go through a full examination of conscience, at the end of confession, at the end of the anointing and the apostolic pardon, viaticum, giving him holy communion and receiving him back into the church, it was such a beautiful experience because I was getting up to leave and I reached over and I kissed him on the forehead and I shook his hand and I expressed how beautiful this was to, to celebrate this with him. And he literally stands up and then gives me a hug and then as I'm walking out to his wife and, and uh, Gus, one of our, one of our brothers here, um, he just started to follow me. And then his wife's like, babe, where are you going? Right now? <laughs> and he just looks around. He's like, going to church. <laughs> I, I don't know. And I'm like, you're going to heaven, man. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Dude. That's what a privilege. Yeah. It's a total to privilege. See Christ in, yeah. in people's lives in that way. Because, yeah. because it was Christ yeah. meeting this Coming man right at the end of his life. And he's been away. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is. If you're thinking about the priesthood, I can't think of a better story to tell than the value of that. So as I can kind of see it, I think there's three classifications of doubt that people will experience, right? One of three things as, as it pertains to the faith, right? Either they believe God exists at all, right? And a lot of times you know, science, just intuition, whatever. Then the second would be they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They're like, I believe there's something out there. There's some kind of demiurge spirit in the universe, but it's not religion. And then the third is doubt in the church, right? And they're all, I think, very specific and different types of doubt, yeah. right? Um, it's good to narrow in on this and, and kind of break that open. Yeah, I yeah. like where you're going with that. So let, I'd like to, what I'd like to do first, and I'd like to talk about all three of those, because I think they're all very different yeah, experiences sure. that people uh, feel. The doubt that God exists, I think, that because obviously everything else is flows from this, you know, the, the incarnation and the church, I mean, it all, if God doesn't exist, none of it matters, right? And I've always kind of thought that the only, the only true atheism is nihilism. Look, if God doesn't exist, nothing matters, right? Nothing does. Nothing matters. No. But for a lot of people, it's, where is God in all this? I mean, I look at a universe that's trillions of light years apart, and there's, you know, quantum foam and physics and Where's the necessity for God in any of this? I die and then I die and I just turn into atoms and we're all stardust, right? I mean, this world has been pushing that on people for the last hundred years, if not since the the um, the enlightenment. 18th, yeah. yeah, since the enlightenment. So, uh, how do you experience that in your priesthood when people say, "Look, I just don't believe in God at all anymore"? Yeah, and and you know, I've I've heard this actually a bunch. Um, and what I find is always an absence of prayer completely, like where people just stop praying and little by little, what erodes away is belief in God. Um, so that's another element of this. But what happens is when people see how they're feeling, then they go into a crisis mode and they see how a culture of nihilism, architecture and art that's built upon nihilism and everything that we're surrounded with in the, in the structures of society today, it's, it's like swallowing people into this, to this hopeless place of God does not exist. And, but the beautiful aspect, and this goes to the priesthood too, for those who are discerning priesthood. You get to witness when people say, I don't want to live here in this place of emptiness and doubt. I'm willing to give this a shot. They charge up their prayer life. They start opening up the word of God. They start praying with the word of God and they start being rebuilt in faith. And, and again, it's like the way that it erodes can also be the way that it gets built up. And then the foundation of your prayer based in scripture begins to bring you into the mystery and then experiencing that mystery entering into the sacramental life. Yeah. And what, what you're mentioning is the, the doubt of a sorrowful heart, you know, and I think another 
doubt is the doubt of a hardened heart, yeah. right? The doubt of mm. accusations towards mm. mocking, right? Mm. Like scientific, uh, you know, like the Dawkins type, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then what you're mentioning is, is, is the doubt of, of a fer- fertile mm. ground for yeah. God to come and, and bring a springtime. Yeah. To. And, and then there's, there's a sense of doubt too, in in respect to, uh, the hardening of the heart that's based on sin. So like pride, mm. cutting oneself off from God and establishing oneself as God, as the yeah. knower of all of these things, and that I'm going to exercise my intellect and knowledge and 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 draw power from that and exercise power. Yeah. Th- th- you know, that too is a hardening of the heart. Yeah. Um, and in respect to the time that one is uh, spending, uh, you know, absent from one's communication with God necessarily has sinful elements to it. So doubt is not, um, doubt is not sinful, right. but the, the things that precede doubt can most certainly be sinful. Come but, from sin. But it not can. always though. I mean, look, at, look at Mother Teresa or St. Paul of the Cross. I wouldn't say that either of them didn't have prayer lives and weren't living the Christian life. And they had 40 years. It'll be St. Oh, Paul across 45 suffering. years, yeah. mother Teresa, 40 years where she's like, I don't know if God's even real. And that's, and that's but why she was immersed in suffering. Like, I mean, I could see how it could overtake you even in the midst of, okay, of but this is a great saint that everyone holds up right. an example or St. Yeah. Paul across founded the passionist. I mean, this, yeah. these are saints, big time saints. Yeah. And they spent most of their lives feeling the complete absence and loss of God. Uh, and that's a real thing that yeah. people struggle with. And they, I mean, you, there's people in your church who won't tell you this because there's someone sitting in their t- seats right now saying, I love the church and I love this, but I don't see God here. Mm-hmm. I get a sense from Protestants, like I would consider faithful Protestants, believers, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, when we start talking about the Catholic church, like there's, there, there's a, I don't know, a vibe I get where they're just like, I like it the way it is. Right. And, and it might be the, the sinfulness or whatever it is, like the conviction doesn't have the full, you know, it's like the seeking can stop here and I, I've got this bucket of my life. And, but like when you challenge them, like, I mean, you could sit, literally sit in front of G, like, oh, uh, you know, that's going to rock my world. It's going to change everything. I think there's doubt when you, talk about that too. It's like leading people closer to God. I think there's a, <clears throat> a, a level of doubt there too as well. Yeah. You know what uh, you're reminding me of is when we were in LA and we met up, uh, you know, and went to that, that evangelical church that oh, Justin yeah. Bieber was at. Yeah, yeah. And we're sitting there. I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> and, you didn't want to go. <laughs> and, and then we were like, we're sitting there and it was just like, it was a concert. Guy preached on the word. He opened up the scripture and then it was like a, a hookup, you know, like, hey, if you're not dating anybody, hang out with this, but you know, and then, and then we're both like sitting there like that's how it ends. And yeah. it's like, we really, weird. we're like, I want to go to the Eucharist right now. You I, know, like all I want, I was like hungering. Yeah. Christ. And both of us were sitting there like this would, th- this would have been great if we just entered into adoration right now, <laughs> you know? And it's, it, but it's true. It's like, it's, it is a, it is a journey of faith and we're all trying to seek that encounter and, but it's, there's questions along the way, especially when adversity is presented. And when you look at a St. Jane uh, de French, uh, Chantel, yep. you look at them, like you said, a mother Teresa uh, or St. Therese of Lisieux for that Not matter. The same thing. Yeah. You know, like all of these men and women in the face of their adversity still professed, I believe out of that place, but it, it took great effort in developing effort. their testimony of faith yeah. because we have to make that effort our labor in prayer. You it's know, liturgia. It is the little, work. it's the work. It is the liturgy of our lives. A lot of those people had structures around them where they could labor in that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't have that nowadays, mm-hmm. especially in a world that is very much post-Christianity. Yeah. You start to struggle. There is no societal guardrails to keep you right there is no family most of probably people in your family are feeling the same way and that's why we're seeing such a rapid decline in faith Mm. 
uh, in, in the belief of God. Uh, and I think you look at like the movement of like the new atheists, like Dawkins and Hitchens and all those people. And they're just like, where's God in all this? You know, mm -hmm. like, it was like we talk about what good were they seeking? They were saying, look, where, where is God when, you know, someone's, when kids get cancer, where is God in, uh, the universe? What necessity does God even play in the modern person's life? How is it any different if I pray or if I don't, how is it any different if I go to church or I don't, my life is going to happen exactly the same. So they're not experiencing that. And these saints, you know, they had the structure around them. You know, when St. Teresa of the Sioux was saying, I struggle with atheism. She was also in a convent. Okay, it's a little bit easier to come out of that. So how how can people kind of gird themselves in a society and world that doesn't help them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I learned uh, in the seminary <clears throat> from Father Mike Moore. Um, like I was really angry at some stuff going on. And he was just like, you, "You did you did you tell God you were angry?" And I was like, "No, why would I do that? Like I'm just pissed off, you know." Like, it's like go to the chapel and then just lay it on him yeah. and then come back to me. And I laid it on him. Yeah. And when I was done, God spoke to my heart. Yeah. Right. And so I think like doubt is it's like if you look at virtue or like the theological virtue or whatever of faith, like doubt is the resistance to build the muscle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. Ah, it's doubt. Weight, yeah. yeah. It's the resistance of uh, you know, uh, you know, like you're lifting weights, right? Like you can't build your faith without experiencing this doubt and moving through it. Yeah. And I, I say this to everybody is like, we all go through it. You got to enter in fully, mm. right? You have to enter, you have to bring it all the way down and lift it all the way yeah. up. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. That's a great analogy. That's, that is great. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. But, and it's true. And, and then that goes to say, once again, that all of the saints, everybody has to experience yeah. that. Yeah. And I'll mention this now. I think it's like, uh, it's appropriate, like with Jen getting brain cancer, like stage four and going through all that. And then your advice to me, which was like, dude, like, don't let the devil, don't project, right? Mm -hmm. So without projection, I was like stuck in this static mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I felt it instead of projecting and experiencing different sinfulness, I literally just dumped it on him. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you want to come at me like this? I can deal with this, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I laid it on him. And then sure enough, the 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 reading was about how uh Peter fell in the waves going mm -hmm. towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, mm -hmm. well, that I was he was ready to speak to me. Yeah. Like at first I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm done. Mm -hmm. Right. Same thing I did in the seminary when yeah. I was getting kicked out. I was like, boom, boom. Ooh, I can, you know, like, come on. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, when you're done yelling, when you're done experiencing the doubt and the, the anger, then like he comes in mm -hmm. and he's like, this is where I want you to be. Mm -hmm. This is where mm -hmm. I want you to be. He wanted Peter to fall yeah. into those ways. Mm -hmm. He wanted that mm -hmm. because if you look at, if you look at where Peter was writing in his epistle and it's one of my favorite lines and I just drew the connection because I was just silent enough to hear it is and I love Peter like I feel like a lot of like Peter which is probably why the reading was there mm -hmm. um, he says be attentive to it the gospel like a dim light shining in the corner right I don't know a lamp in the mm -hmm. corner like a dim lamp in the corner until the morning rises in your soul right is that not mm -hmm. is that not what what this is like it's yeah. it's literally like focusing on this dim lamp mm. in your in your life mm. until the morning comes which i think a lot of people just abandon god mm. right i could easily abandon him mm -hmm. and believe me that was on my lips yeah you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> like it yeah. was on my lips but at the end of the day if you pay attention if you're attentive to it like he was attentive to the ghost mm -hmm. of jesus mm -hmm. right this this not his re real like appearance, yeah. but this dim light. They, they think it's like a phantom. Right. Yeah. And he wrote that in his epistle. Mm. And I really think it came from that. It's like, mm. I, 
I, I, have I to like focus. that a lot. I like yeah. the whole sense of this projection. Like, you know, okay, I could project right now. I'm in the boat. Waves are crashing. And I look out and I project what that reality is that I see at a distance. And it is a phantom ghost and it's coming to kill us. Like mm-hmm. well, our death is imminent. Death is imminent in this situation. But it's like, no, Jesus comes draws close to them, reveals that he is present and then calls Peter out of the boat. And it's like, overcome your fear of death, overcome this, step out with me. Now is your time. You never could imagine doing it. Well, if I can come out, call me, call me. I will come out. I will step on the waters of this death and I will be faithful. But it's like, no, it's like our humanity is prone to step into the water yeah. and sink. Well, he's yeah. walking first, yeah. and then took his eyes off and fell. Yeah. yeah. So I it's mean, just like- down right there. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus desires us <laughs> to be humbled <laughs> and then to recognize <clears throat> how we are utterly dependent on him. That's it. I, it. What I realized is through all of this is that this is not my home. Yeah. This is not- I'm holding on to an ideal of my faith, yeah. of my life, of the people that surround me, as if it's going to just remain. Mm. And he just interrupts that briefly mm. as a movement of your soul to draw you closer to where you're going. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and, and like, I remember you like telling me like, oh, it's just like, I just love the brutal, the dark and the like all this stuff about God. And I experienced that. I experienced like, the brutal humanity that he loves, mm. you know, I was yeah. just like, it's a mess yeah. out there, yeah. you know? And it could be a mess in here. It's a mess in there because it's a mess out there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, nope, that's where it's, yeah. He's, coming. yeah. he's like, I'm a year. Yeah. I'm here. You're like, dang, son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can all pretend that life isn't what it is. We can all deny it. We can all try to avoid it and escape it. Life is hard. You die. Yeah, <laughs> you have challenges. Congratulations! People around you are You've going been to, chosen. People around you are going to die. Yeah, that is that's life. It's hard, and people uh, when they're faced with that, they say, "I don't want to deal with it." They yeah, avoid it. I yeah. don't want to deal with it. I don't even believe in God. It's too serious. It's too serious, and they just put it off and wait. Yeah. That's that's for me in ten years to deal with. That's for me tomorrow. Screw you, future me. You can deal with dying right now. I'm just gonna play my video games or drink my booze or yeah. whatever it is that's distracting me from the reality of what life is like. So this, uh, this reminds me of father Peter, my buddy, he was preaching the other day and he said this awesome, awesome expression. He's like, if you worry, you will die. If you don't worry, you will die. <laughs> Why worry? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yes, it's excellent. <laughs> that's awesome. But it's like, it, it is, it is a leveraging tool to help kind of populate. Like, yeah, that may work for some people. It kind of works for me. It's like, that makes a ton of sense. So these leveraging tools is, is what's going to kind of help all of us burst out of the constricting power of what doubt uh, does. So, you know, if, if you, if you're going to die and you've got doubts, you're going to die with doubts, with doubts, <laughs> you know, and, and the reality of it is we know Jesus by testimony rose from the dead. We know that the saints have expressed their intercession and their power in the world. You know, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. We could look through all of these proofs for the existence of God. We can, whatever path that we're on, but necessarily we have to encounter moments along the way where it becomes personal. My, my priesthood, I'm responding to people's death, grieving, suffering, pain on a daily basis. Where it becomes personal for me is when my best friend's wife gets a brain tumor. Mm. I'm receiving that in a totally different way. So my heart is affected by that. My prayer changes. The intensity of that is now something, something is happening and now I'm being challenged because of my love, you know? So it's like, it becomes personal. 
it becomes like we we're now we're now going through this time of adversity as a family in the Catholic talk show. Mm -hmm. You know? So these occasions are but occasions, like you were saying, for Christ to manifest his mercy and his power. And it will necessarily be established. You, what you're talking about reminds me of a really famous ph philosophical statement, uh, Pascal's Wager. Mm. And Pascal, was he was a philosopher, uh, 1700s, and he's like, there's two choices, right? Let's just imagine you're flipping a coin. On one side, God exists. On the other side, he doesn't exist, okay? What do you have to gain by believing that God exists? Everything. What do you have to lose by not believing God exists? Nothing. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Nothing. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. If God doesn't exist and you believe, well, it's the same thing that if you didn't believe, the same result will happen. Mm. If you do believe and he is real, you gain everything. If you don't believe and he's real, you lose everything. So it's kind of almost like- It is a similar, that's similar. Yeah, it's like you have nothing to like lose that. by believing. Yeah. Now, that's not always good enough for people who are right in the middle of it, you know, but yeah. it's, it's a good concept at least. And th that wasn't even Pascal's main reason for coming up with that, but the, the, the proof still, or the, the concept is still there that it's like, if you're going through this life and you have no reason to believe, what reason do you have to live? Mm. Right? Mm. What, what are you living for? Wow. So that was kind of talking about the disbelief in God. I think the second part is the disbelief in Jesus Christ, right? Okay, well, I believe God exists. I believe there's a, a great spirit in the sky who created the universe. And then after that, he peaced out and leave, left us to everything. Because, you know, I can sense the supernatural, but Jesus never even claimed to be God. Jesus was just a wise preacher. God is whoever he wanted, you know, him to be or her to be or whatever. That's the second f form of doubt that I think is really assailing our society. Mm. Just the doubt in the truth of what Jesus said about himself, right? You know, the, mm. the Lord, liar, lunatic mm. argument of C.S. Lewis. Like, if Jesus said yeah. what he said, he was either, he's either the Lord or a liar <laughs> or a lunatic. Mm. But he has to be one of the three. Mm. And evaluating the claims of Jesus, which really is Christianity versus just the universe or karma or the planets or whatever the hell you want to believe in, mm -hmm. right? That's the central claim. So what was Jesus? Was he the Lord? Is he a liar or a lunatic? Mm. You know? I like that. You know, I, I really want to jump into scripture right now based on this. So this is John chapter 11. The context is the raising of Lazarus, Jesus's friend. Uh, from the dead. So starting at verse 20, chapter 11, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she says, even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And this is my favorite part of this verse. Do you believe this? You know, wow. like that sense of Jesus delivering, like, do you believe this? Oh. You know, and there are other areas in, in Jesus's public ministry where he kind of leaves people with a question, mm -hmm. you know, but this one's a big one. Do you believe? Mm -hmm. Do you believe this? And we know what Jesus does in manifesting his power over death by raising Lazarus from the, from the tomb and how this, how this scripture verse uh, concludes. So, you know, definitely read John 11, if you're out there, just to, just to dive into the fullness of, of that chapter um, and, and how Jesus showcases this power. But it's like, she knows, right? That's the whole you thing. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. she knows. Yeah. But does she believe? Yeah. Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter. Right. So it's the same thing right. for right. us. It's like, we know things. Right. But like, 
Well, when does it get deeper? Like circumstances change in your life, yeah. and you and you become challenged. Yeah, like you know, obviously the challenge of my wife and everything, uh-huh. and the blur of like taking her to surgery and this and that. And like, it was like I didn't even know what day it was. Yeah. Like yeah. I was living in some like alternate world or something, yeah. you know. And uh, and then you're and then like you come to grips with like what's actually happening one day, mm. and then you're challenged. Do you believe? Mm. Do you believe? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's literally what, I mean, it's, that's Peter, right? It's Peter mm-hmm. on the water too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> and that, that makes me think of Conchita Cabrera in her book, Season of the Soul. Right? Yeah. It's real easy to believe in springtime when everything's nice and soft and cool and beautiful and flowery. It's real easy when everything's just coming up. But when life gets hard and all the heat and the pressure's burning up, mm-hmm. all the faith that you had extra, and now you're down to the heart of the matter. That's when it becomes hard to believe, mm-hmm. you know, and that's when a lot of people say, well, well, where were you? You know, where, where's, where's this, you know, great consoler, this great help, this person who's going to mm. save me from all this. Okay, so, okay. Like you said, that's circumstances, you know, believing in principle, like you said, mm-hmm. you know, with Martha Do Mary. You believe? It's easy. Like, oh yeah, I believe. I believe you, Lord. Of yeah. course. I. Oh, but wait a second. Let me throw now it's real. You. Now mm-hmm. Lazarus is dead. Now do I really believe that? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Right? When and the this, chips are down. And this comes out of a relationship that was intimately close yeah. to Christ, like his best friend. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, and the components yeah. of that and the circumstances of that need to be interiorized in our lives like we personally yeah personally and and that is the expression of a faith that is elected and permanent so saint peter says in the scripture saint peter says in the scriptures be prepared at any given moment to give testimony for the reason in which you believe and 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 have faith like be prepared so what is the reason is it cs lewis is it a simple uh you know expression you know like yeah is it a is it what gives you that disposition of belief? Because we want to be in the College of Saints, like a Mother Teresa, like a Saint Therese of Lisieux, that says, though I'm experiencing all this stuff, I'm still going to say, I believe. Mm-hmm. I believe it. And, you know, and we know how those lives of witnesses have ended. And they and they live in a very privileged situation before God, awaiting that final resurrection. You know, that's what we are all waiting for is that final judgment and the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth, you know, where the kingdom has fully come. Again, I mean, if if the universe is just created and controlled by an impersonal force or God, and then he left and, you know, the clockmaker argument, Mm -hmm. he wound it up and then left us to our own devices. How is that really any different than a universe with no God? I mean, an impersonal God who doesn't care about our fortunes or benefits, it's not a God that we're, I would worship. Yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, a God that doesn't care about us, a God who just left us to our own devices and I created you, now die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. And that's, that's not what God is. God is love. The only, you can't create without love. So I think that precludes the, op, the, the, the reality that God could be an impersonal God, but a personal God is Jesus Christ. It is a God who took on the flesh, who took on human suffering to become like us. God became man, so man can become God, mm-hmm. right? Like the Eastern mm-hmm. fathers would yeah. preach. And that's, it's, it, it could be hard to look at the personification of Jesus. I mean, I know the early church struggled with this and they said, well, is he maybe kind of not God? You know, the, the, the nature of God and Christ and the Trinity and everything. But God without Christ, God as not a Trinity is a logic. You have to have a love and a lover and the love, right? You have to, a God cannot be real without being triune, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why that's the faith of our church. So I think the necessity of Christ being the second person of the Trinity speaks to the reality of God and speaks to the necessity of believing that Christ is that second person of the mm. Trinity. Mm. And I mean, he even mentions it in, in the Bible and even in John, like, I mean, he, he goes through these discourses where he's like, I am one with the father. Like he's explaining to them, like, this is the father who sent me like the father, you know, like he just, how keeps, can you ask us to show you the father? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. That's it. Yeah. Mm. And they're, 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 
they're not interchangeable. They are one, yeah. right? Mm. The other thing that I'm thinking about too in all of this, um, Father Kevin, when we were on the the when he was given the women's retreat without Jen, I, w- I went out to check it out, and he said, you know, like we go through all these things in our lives, and God gives us little inches along the way for things to make sense. But when you get to heaven, like everything that you've ever thought completely begins like to manifest itself into the reality of who God was and this world that we're living in and the, the trajectory that we were on Mm -hmm. and now being with him forever in heaven, like all that completely makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have any doubt anymore. It's Mm -hmm. just like, it's, it's, it comes to its perfection Mm -hmm. in us, Mm -hmm. right. In heaven. Mm. Beatific vision, I think you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the third doubt is the doubt of whether the Catholic Church is the one true church founded by Jesus Christ. So, you know, we've talked about not believing in God. We've talked about not believing that Jesus is God if God exists. Well, then that leads us to, okay, well, then if God and Jesus are both real, then what is Christianity, right? Um, and that gets down to belief in the church. And I think people's faith in the church can be damaged by a lot of things. I mean, I know sexual abuse scandal destroyed so many people's faith, particularly those people who were the victims of it. Mm -hmm. But then the people who said, okay, well, this is a divine institution. And then you've got the people who are supposed to be the very, you know, safekeepers of the divine flame and and of the the, uh, monsters. How could that be the church Jesus wanted? Right. Or Jesus didn't want a church. The church is inside of us. Me and you are the church. Maybe the real church is the friends we made along the way. You know, you got a lot of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Can well, I can I make a comment though too? Because um, I I do I do agree with uh, what you're what you're sharing that this can ultimately create these uh, these outcomes. But I've met a number of people personally that I've had the the honor and the heartbreaking uh, pastoral care for people who have been abused, and I've received them, and they have never strayed from their faith. You know, they, they have stayed locked into the love of Christ and they recognize the sin of that particular priest. Um, so I, I do want to give, you know, a big um, supportive care for people who have had to suffer something like that, which causes scandal. And I think a, I think a number of people that look at the, the aspect of that happening that haven't suffered it, they can, that can be so scandalous in which it would turn out where they, they would use that mm-hmm. as a, you know, no, I'm not going to believe in the church because this has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is our humanity that uh, is inclined towards sinfulness um, that these occasions have happened regrettably. But it is Christ continually reaching out to the depths of human depravity within the church so that healing and reconciliation and the church continues to do its work as a field hospital Mm -hmm. for all people, laity, priests, cardinals, bishops, Pope, we all need that. Yep. And that's, and that's why we have the church. I mean, it's not going to be easy. Like we were saying, life is brutal. Life can be hard. And you know, the the church is often called the bark of St. Peter because we live in this big stormy world and the boat is the church. That's the thing that's keeping us safe and getting us to the safe shores of heaven. Right. Mm-hmm. And there, there's so many things And this episode is not about whether the Catholic church is the true church. That would take a whole different episode. But I, I just want to think I wanted to say that it's, it's understandable to think, is this, real you know yeah. is this the right church with with, with things that can yeah, and question I, your faith, but i right? think this is a great way to land this episode because you know the church as it is has been held together through the sacramental life of the church mm-hmm through the seven sacraments and through the mystical establishment and institution that Jesus set up 2000 years ago, we have been governed in that sacramental church by Christ's love. It's the only reason that this church is still here. You know, any other type of organization, any type of legal code, any type of institution or nation has come and gone. 
And, and in the revolving nature of the world, this, this institution that Christ has established has already proven itself that it's not going anywhere until the end of time. Mm -hmm. It is well established because it has been established by God. So that's not going to, that's not going to change. It's the cornerstone. Yeah. That the builders rejected. Yeah. You know, and that, and that cornerstone has established the church, the one church. And, you know, that will continue to be here. Even if, uh, you know, fires destroy or earthquakes swallows, or, you know, uh, a scandal happens within or outside or whatever it is, the church still stands. You know what I don't have doubts about? That Hollow is a great app. I don't doubt that. No doubt. Hollow, no doubt. Shout out to Gwen Stefani. Right. That's our buddy. <laughs> Which I don't know if we can mention her name in a promotion for Hollow that might violate laws. We do not intend to. <laughs> no doubt. We do not intend to infer that Gwen Stefani loves Hollow, although I'm sure she does. But Hollow is the number one Catholic prayer app. Uh, over a billion prayers have been prayed through it. Mm -hmm. It has every feature and function you can want to help support you in your prayer life from meditations, Bible readings, reflections, sleep aids, sacred music, podcasts, uh, all the you know great uh, you know people within the church like Father Mike Schmitz and, and Matt Fratt and Bishop Barron and Jonathan Rumi and you name them, they're on there. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can try out this app 100% free. It's got so many great features that I use every day, Divine uh, Mercy and Rosary. Go check it out and see why it's the number one app uh, for Catholic prayer. Mm. And, you know, before we before we get going and the importance of prayer, I'm just so grateful um, for the creators of Hallow and those who have developed such a, a robust uh, app. It, the importance of prayer, fundamentally, as we began this episode, is evocative of faith. Scripture informs prayer. Prayer is an expression to God. And as you communicate with God, your relationship you are, that you're fostering, you will be able to move through the many layers of doubt in your life. Stay strong, stay forbearant, and we're with you. You know, we, on, on behalf of Howard and the Catholic Talk Show, our prayers are with you. And we appreciate your prayers for us. And especially as Ryan and Jen are going through this very difficult time, your prayers are most welcome. So please lift up prayer through the intercession of Solanus Casey. In the comment section below, you'll see the prayer of Solanus Casey. And as we conclude this episode, we're going to pray that together. And I invite you to journey with us uh, through prayerful invocation, through the intercession of Solanus Casey, uh, so that he can receive a miracle and we can receive a miracle um, in the healing of our sister Jen. So let us conclude with prayer. And again, I invite you to join with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer for Canonization of Blessed Solanus Casey. O God, I adore you. I give myself to you. May I be the person you want me to be, and may your will be done in my life today. I thank you for the gifts you gave Father Solanus. If it is your will, bless us with the canonization of Father Solanus so that others may imitate and carry on his love for all the poor and suffering of our world. As he joyfully accepted your divine plans, I ask you, according to your will, to hear my prayer. And now we wrap our minds and our hearts around Jennifer Delacross, and we pray for her healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, you know, Delacross, you said that you have a, a second-class relic. Yeah. Of uh, the pillow that he died on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I've got two. Mm -hmm. So, hopefully somebody might need it later, mm -hmm. you know. But, yeah, uh, yeah we're, uh, I think, officially today, just mm -hmm. being with you guys uh, and talking to, about, you know, canonization and miracles and the process that, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're, we've now designated him as our intercessor. Yeah. Amen.
And we're joining together each and every week right here at the Catholic Talk Show. We're living our life and embracing the faith that has been entrusted to us in Christ. United as one in him, we will overcome every adversity as we draw closer to the kingdom of heaven that is coming. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.